The members of this 21st century Bedouin caravan, one of the few still operating in Mesopotamia, are probably unaware they're walking on land that, centuries ago, belonged to a great people, the Aramaeans. In the course of centuries, this ancient race has left an indelible mark on world history. Today, it is as if the memory of this people has been lost in the mists of time, in a land that has nurtured hundreds and hundreds of years of history in which the Aramean heritage has played no role. Nevertheless, enclaves of Aramaeans live on, a few still clinging to their roots in the Middle East, the majority dispersed in communities scattered all over the world, and all brought together by their church, the Syrian Orthodox Church, that has recorded their heritage and preserved their language. The term Aram appeared for the first time in the 23rd century BC to indicate a region of upper Mesopotamia where this nomadic people had settled. The history of the Aramaeans a Semitic people which traces its lineage to Aram, son of Shem, Noah's fourth son, has its roots in ancient texts, including the Old Testament and the Quran, a heritage confirmed by recent archaeological finds. The Bible tells of Abraham, the wandering Aramean, from Ur of the Chaldees in southern Iraq, who settled for a long time with his family in the region of Aram Naharaim, meaning the Aram of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, specifically in Haran, in the southeast corner of modern Turkey. Later, when Abraham wanted for his son Isaac a wife who was not from the land of Canaan where they had finally made their home, he sent his servant back to Haran. The servant found Rebekah, daughter of Bathuel the Aramean, son of Milka, wife of Abraham's brother, and consequently the patriarch's great niece. When the servant first set eyes on her, she was fetching water at the well, a daily chore that continues today. Tell me, my child, who is your father? Can your father give us shelter for the night? I am the daughter of Batul, the son of Milka by Nako. We have no lack of straw and hay, and our home is a roomy house to lodge in. Later, when it came time for Isaac's son Jacob to marry, Isaac followed his father's example and gave his son this order. Go to Padan Aram, the house of Batul, the father of your mother, and take from there your wife from among the daughters of Laban, brother of your mother. Jacob did as he was told and found three shepherds minding their flocks near a well. My brothers, where are you from? We are from Haran. Do you know Laban, son of Nakor? We do. Is he well? Yes. Oh, that's his daughter Rachel approaching with the flock. Jacob kissed Rachel, a shepherdess like those still found today near Haran, and told her they were related because he was Rebekah's son. Therefore, he was an Aramean, just like her family. Abraham the Wandering Aramean brings us to 1850 BC, but it is only in around 1100 BC that the first explicit mention of the Aramaeans appears in the annals of the king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser I, in which are recorded battles against the Alamu Aramean nomads along the banks of the Euphrates. I forded the river Euphrates 28 times and followed the Aramean people from Beshre to Tadmor, from the city of Rafik in Babylonia to the city of Anat in the region of Suhi, and to Gargamish and to the east of the plains of Sru. It was here that Dura Europus was founded as a river port and defensive point against attacks from Mesopotamia. This ancient city, founded in the 4th century BC by Seleucus, Alexander the Great's lieutenant and head of the Seleucid dynasty, was for a long time not only an impregnable fortress that defended the kingdom of Syria, but also an important trade center on the caravan route that linked Mesopotamia to the Arabian Gulf and to Antioch, the ancient capital of Syria. Captured and razed to the ground by the Sassanids in 256 AD, the city, or what was left of it, 
was buried under the sand for 1,700 years. Today, Dura Europis is one of Syria's most important archaeological sites, a veritable trove for archaeological finds and a constant source of precious information that serves to reconstruct the history and the customs of people who, like the Aramaeans, inhabited this area even before the city existed. The citadel of Dura Europas overlooked the majestic Euphrates, along which the Aramaeans founded various city-states. Some are named in the Old Testament, Aram Soba, Aram Bitrehob, Padan Aram, Aram Damascus. Others, such as Bit Adini, have been passed down from Assyrian sources. At the end of the 10th century BC, the Assyrian Empire started its expansion towards the west and gradually conquered the neighboring city-states that, until then, had maintained their independence. This is why documents regarding the Aramaean civilization are often found in Assyrian Babylonian archaeological digs. In 1979, at Tel Fekiriye, just south of the Turkish Syrian border, a great statue came to light. It is now in the Museum of Damascus and dates back to the 9th century BC when it was erected by a certain Hadad Izi, a Syrian governor of Gozan for the Assyrians, king of Gozan for the Aramaeans, in honor of the god Hadad, lord of the water in the heavens and on the earth that brings richness, creates pastures, and irrigates all the land. On the tunic is a long inscription in the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian and in Aramaic. The Akkadian text is inscribed in the place of honor, the front, while the Aramaic text is relegated to the back. Hadad the storm god was one of the most important divinities worshipped by the Aramaeans. He is sometimes depicted brandishing thunderbolts, as on this stele in the Louvre in Paris. Hadad Izi of Gozan was not the only Aramaean king to have left a relic that has come down to us intact. In the Museum of Aleppo, at the foot of a likeness of the god Melkart, an inscription attests to it being the statue that Bar Hadad, king of Aram, erected out of gratitude to Melkart, his lord, who answered his prayer. A longer inscription, also at the Louvre, was inscribed by Zakir, the king of Hamath, in thanks for a victory over 16 other Aramean kings. The god who gave him that victory was Baal Shamayin, Baal, the lord of the heavens, who could be the same god as Hadad. The longest of the ancient Aramaic inscriptions preserved in the National Museum of Damascus is, however, a treatise between a certain Bargaya, perhaps a high official of the Assyrian king himself, and Matiel, the king of the Aramean city-state of Arpad. In the text, Bargaya lists a series of curses against Matiel should the agreement ever be broken. If Matiel is dishonest in the dealings, let his kingdom become a kingdom of sand, a kingdom of dreams that dies like a flame. Let Hadad hurl his wrath and all sorts of disasters on the earth and in the heavens. Let him send hail unto Arpad. Let the locusts go mad for seven years. Let not a blade of grass grow that one can see neither vegetation nor green pastures. Let not the sound of a lyre be heard in Arpad or among its inhabitants, but only moans of desperation, crying, and lamentations. Aside from the inscriptions, there exists other proof of these Aramean city-states, such as the stone sculptures unearthed at Gozantal Halaf on view in the Museum of Aleppo. The delicately sculpted ivories from Hadatu Arzlantash in the Museum of Aleppo and the Louvre. Fresco fragments from the mid-8th century, also in Aleppo. 
the frontispiece of the Temple of Haddad in the National Museum of Damascus. The Aramean city-states, whether independently or as a group, engaged in recurrent conflicts not only with the Assyrians but also with the Israelites. Like the Assyrians, the Israelites were defeated several times by the Arameans, who, in turn, were several times defeated by them. Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt are the countries that still today preserve the memory of the ancient Aramean civilization, often only in place names. First and foremost, the Aram Naharain, the Aram of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Mesopotamia of today, the cradle of the Arameans. Then Padan Aram, the field or highway of Aram. Arpad, Bitadini, Amku, Nisibin, Edessa, the Valley of Orontes, the Valley of the al Bikka, Koba Betrehot, the Valley of the Litani, Hamath, Sam al Gozan, Damascus, the sites in which the Aramaeans played a key role from the 11th to the 8th century BC. in an endless succession of wars among themselves and against outside enemies. Then, in 732 BC, the Aramaeans were finally defeated by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III. Damascus was destroyed. Its last king, Ratson II, was killed, and the territory was broken up into provinces that were annexed by Assyria. Damascus will cease to be a city. It will become a collection of ruins. Its neighborhoods will be abandoned forever and will become grazing land. I will set fire to the walls of Damascus and it will devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And the people of Aram will become slaves. Thus, the biblical prophecies came true. From that moment onward, the dispersion of the Aramaeans began. Without a land of their own, they were condemned to wander over the course of time to the four quarters of the world. Nevertheless, in their own way, the Aramaeans actually conquered the world, not with arms and the might of their nation, but with a far more effective instrument, their language that has survived through the centuries and has come down to us in the liturgy of the Syrian Orthodox Church and the other Syriac churches. The inscription on the famous 9th century BC statue of Haddad is the oldest surviving document of the Aramaic language and evidence that in around 1000 BC, the Aramaeans adopted the Phoenician alphabet composed of 22 letters. They used it without adding as much as one character, even though the phonetic system of the Aramaic language was much richer than Phoenician. Long before conquering the Aramaean city-states, the Assyrians realized that it was much faster and more practical to write in Aramaic rather than Akkadian, the accepted language of the day. Akkadian contained an unwieldy number of characters compared to the 22 letters of the Phoenician Aramaic alphabet. In addition, Aramaic could be written with ink on skins or on papyrus, while the cuneiform Akkadian required a stylus which impressed the wedge-shaped characters onto soft clay tablets. Because of its simplicity and rapidity, Aramaic soon became an international language used in official documents, in diplomatic reports, and in commercial transactions. 
In the second book of Kings, the ministers of King Hezekiah, in order to avoid being understood by the people, ask the emissary of the king of Assyria, please speak to us in the Aramaic tongue so that only we can understand you. 100 years later, a Philistine king wrote in Aramaic to the Pharaoh of Egypt asking for military help to stem the advance of the Babylonian army. Paradoxically, after 732 BC, the year of the defeat of the last Aramean kingdom, the language of the defeated people became a universal language. Easier to write than Akkadian, and with instruments that were easier to come by, it was a kind of shorthand compared to the complicated Akkadian that remained a language for scribes and scholars, while Aramaic became a popular language used by all social classes. Thus, in due course, Aramaic spread throughout a vast area from Asia Minor and Afghanistan to Egypt and North Africa, reaching as far as India and leaving many traces of its presence. In Jordan, the spectacular site of Wadi Musa, or the Valley of Moses, is a prelude to the fascination of Petra, the capital of the Nabataeans, and another source of evidence of the Aramean presence. We pass through the Sikh Gorge, following one of the many canals dug out of the rock as part of a complex irrigation system for which the Aramean Nabataeans became famous. It leads us directly to the Pink City, as Petra is called, in reference to the color of the sandstone from which, one might say, it is sculpted. Aramaic, written in a distinctive local script, was the language of the Nabataeans who flourished from the first century BC to the first century AD. They carved their capital out of the living rock. In truth, Petra was a stronghold, located strategically on the main route between the north and south of the Arab Peninsula, traveled by caravans with precious loads of incense and myrrh from Arabia, spices and silks from India, ivory from Africa, and precious skins. From this well-protected, dominant position, it was easy to raise tolls, to demand exorbitant sums for food, shelter, and stabling, and to play a key role in the commerce between merchants and caravaneers. And, of course, it was easy to plunder, too. Thus, the Aramean Nabataeans became rich and powerful. Then, in 106 AD, the Romans incorporated the kingdom of Petra into the Roman Empire, making it the capital of the new province of Arabia. This led to the development of new caravan routes, slowly diverting trade away from Petra and causing its decline. The Nabataeans' own dialect of Aramaic has survived in inscriptions on the pediments of buildings and temples, on rocks and stones, at the base of votive capitals, and on the walls of gullies. In the latter case, the writing is in the guise of implorations to the gods to avert disaster in the event of flash floods that would race through the gorges, sweeping away everything in their path.
a garden of 500,000 palm trees, and the imposing vestiges of what was once a large Roman city in the middle of the desert are the most remarkable characteristics of Palmyra, the ancient Tadmor in the heart of Syria, another hub of the Aramaic linguistic area. As in Petra, traces of the Aramaic idiom that used to be spoken here can still be found. The extraordinary story of this city features, among others, Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, one of the greatest women of ancient times. Beautiful, noble, ambitious, a charismatic leader, and an indefatigable horsewoman, Zenobia addressed her people in Aramaic, wearing a helmet and purple robes. For a short period, the armies of Palmyra even managed to seize control of many of the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. This was in the day of the Emperor Aurelian, who eventually managed to capture Palmyra and take Queen Zenobia prisoner. Since very early times, the oasis was inhabited by the Aramaeans, and here, people spoke Aramaic of Palmyra. Traces of that language can be seen on the Roman colonnade along the main road. Beneath the inscriptions in Greek are the same words in Aramaic. Qabura dina abad bil hazai bar buraiki bar bil hazai Today, in the local museum, the voice of a scholar reading those Aramaic inscriptions as though they were current idiom gives the impression of being caught in a time warp. Hatra in Iraq was founded in the 1st century BC and was destroyed by the Persians early in the 3rd century AD.